Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Research Roundtable, the IOCDF stream dedicated to picking an interesting topic and a developing one um, within the OCD literature and talking about it with people who know it really well. My name is Kyle King. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. I'm a national advocate with the IOCDF, and I'm also a student. I study neuroscience at Yale, and I'm interested in OCD not only because I think it's really fascinating, uh, but also because I have it. So a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the show is is really relevant to the way I, I think of, of my own OCD and I think about it as it applies to my daily life. Um, I'm always, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, John Abramowitz. John, if you'd like to say a word about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Kyle. I'm John Abramowitz. I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I've been studying OCD and treating, helping folks who have it for my professional career. And I'm very excited um, for our show today. Yeah, and it's it's good. We already have some enthusiasm in the comments. It's already been a minute. We got a couple questions in there. Um, that's good. Keep it coming. Uh, I, and for today, we're going to be talking about sleep and OCD, and we have three like th the perfect panelists to be discussing this topic. Um, but before I introduce them, I do have a couple <laughs> announcements that I got to say. First, this live stream is educational and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment-related questions, please work with your provider or contact the local clinician. You can use the ICDS online resource directory at icdf.org backslash find help to locate a trained clinician near you. Second, the International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline. If you're in a crisis or if you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please call the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988. You can also access this online at www.988lifeline.org or go to your local emergency room or call 911. And also, I just mentioned the comment section. Uh, we do have a comment section, and we love when you post questions on there. Just be mindful. Everything you put on there is going to live on the internet forever. So you don't want to put something <laughs> bad in the comment section. Uh, but we've never really had a problem with that. Okay, I think those are all the things that I have to ramble off. So now it's time to introduce the interesting people on, this, on the show today. Um, who's the first bio that I have? I'll start with Dr. Jacob Noda. Um, did I pronounce your last name, just to be sure? Yep, that's right. Sick. <laughs> um, so Dr. Noda is a staff psychologist at McLean's Hospital OCD, OCD Institute, where he works in the Office of Clinical Assessment and Research. He's an instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He's also the president and founder of Overbrook Counseling Services, which provides outpatient specialized OCD and related disorders treatment in Massachusetts. Jacob, I was trying to think of an interesting question to break the ice, and what I settled on was... If you were the Academy at the Oscars on Sunday, what would you have picked to be the best picture of the year? Uh, well, among the ones that were nominated, I did see Oppenheimer and like it. So I was okay with that pick. I have to be honest, I didn't see a lot of them. So I watch a lot of yeah. movies, but not Oscar quality movies. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was cool with Oppenheimer. A lot of like rom-coms okay. with my wife and kids movies. I have a four-year-old, so yeah, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, I have, Disney movies probably don't typically win Best Picture. Although I wonder if anyone, any of them have. Yeah. Our uh, second panelist is Dr. Rebecca Cox. Dr. Cox is a postdoctoral fellow in the sleep and chrono, chronobiology laboratory at the University of Colorado Boulder. She completed her PhD in clinical psychology at Vanderbilt University. Her research examines the role of sleep and circadian rhythm disruption in OCD and whether sleep and circadian medicine can be leveraged as novel treatment approaches to OCD. Rebecca, I'm gonna ask you the same question. And it doesn't have to be something that was nominated. It can just be whatever your favorite movie for the year was. Okay, so similar to Jacob, I also typically do not watch Oscar quality movies, but um, I think it is a real tragedy that um, the Barbie movie didn't receive more <laughs> recognition than it did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would definitely vote for Barbie Best Picture. I never, I didn't see Oppenheimer. I don't know if you did, John. Oh, I, great no? movie. Yeah. Oh, great movie. Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I, I saw I, Barbie and I loved it. So I, 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 I loved Barbie. Barbie. Was, was Barbie nominated? Was no, it, nominated? it wasn't. I, was I mean, I know that some somebody got like supporting actor or actress or something. Yeah. From from uh, that. But um yeah, no, they got it right. I in my opinion, they got it right with Oppenheimer. I loved it. that. Was it maybe it was a little longer than it had to be. But yeah, I, three, I, I'm I, not gonna sit down for three hours. I'm gonna fall asleep, which is yeah. <laughs> it's a great story though, and you know, and and the, they're well, 
We're talking about OC. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later, John, off camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, our third panelist is Dr. Meredith Coles. Dr. Coles is a professor of psychology at Binghamton University in Binghamton, New York. She has served mm -hmm. on the faculty there for the past 20 years and founded the Binghamton Anxiety Clinic in 2004. Binghamton Anxiety Clinic specializes in the assessment and treatment of OCD and provides services to both children and adults. Dr. Cole's research focuses on identifying novel approaches to understanding OCD. Most recently, they have developed a line of work examining the interplay between sleep and circadian rhythm in OCD. Dr. Cole's, same question. You've had time to prepare. I have, have like zero pop culture knowledge. So take care of that. Um, I'll go with Barbie because I saw that one. <laughs> Okay, I, fair I enough. <laughs> I don't okay, so we don't have a lot of movie buffs on the stream today, but that's okay. We're not talking about movies. Um, well, Alicia just mentioned the holdovers, which I loved also. That was a great. Mm. I did. I see did that. hear that, that one was, was one. really good. Um, but so we're talking about sleep and OCD. Um, I started reading a little bit of some papers that I could find online uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. and like the the first question that really jumped out at me is this doesn't seem like an obvious thing to be looking into. Like I wouldn't think, Oh, like what, what might I associate with OCD? Sleep doesn't jump out as something mm -hmm. that's like immediately clear. Mm -hmm. um, so what's kind of like the history with this mm -hmm. research? Why did people start investigating this? Uh, do, you go, do you want me to go? Or... Anyway. Um, I was going to say, my I... answer is I learned it from Meredith. So Meredith. <laughs> <probably> is... <laughs> yeah. So Jake was one of my graduate students. Um, graduated from my lab, so I tainted him. Um, I just noticed um, a, several, like it was common for patients to come in and say they couldn't go to sleep till like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. And I started noticing that like early in my career. And then I don't know, the bunch of things converged. I'd recently had a baby and I had lots of intrusive thoughts. So Jaws does work on pregnancy and, and OCD. Um, just a bunch of things converged. And I had a client come in that was really severe, really treatment resistant. And um, she did all her compulsions late at night. Um, and so we just decided, to, I'm not even sure how, but we did, I decided we tried to see if there was a relationship between time of day she was doing her compulsions and how long they took. And it came out a really strong relationship that the, when she started before midnight, it took her markedly less time than when she started after midnight. Um, so mm -hmm. just through talking with her and thinking, we decided, she actually said, should I go to bed earlier? And I said, well, maybe that's a good idea, you know? And we tried that and um, shifted her sleep schedule just behaviorally. So she'd get up a half hour early, every earlier, a couple of days, every couple of days. And she would call me when she woke up every morning. So I'd be teaching and I'd say, we're going to take a one minute break. And I'd answer the phone, <laughs> say, I'm glad you're up and hang up <laughs> in the middle of teaching. <laughs> um, and we shifted her sleep schedule and her OC symptoms just plummeted. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Um, so I looked around the literature. There were a couple of papers linking OCD to this delayed sleep timing. And it's just like gone from there. We've been studying it now for 15 years or something, 10 years or something. So it was really observing a client and listening to them and realizing I kept seeing it in clients. So maybe we should study it, <laughs> you know, kind of taking from the, from the clinic to the lab. Mm -hmm. This is always a good way to get started. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what a clinical scientist does. Yeah. I think it's a great, great example of like taking the, the knowledge from the clinic to the science. Um, and for me personally, I actually came at this question from the opposite direction from, from the science to more of the practice. Um, when I was in undergraduate, I was um, involved in a sleep deprivation lab. Um, and so I kind of had this firsthand experience of seeing how when we don't get enough sleep, um, you know, we're, we're more disinhibited, our executive functions impaired and, and people get really kind of moody. And so that made me kind of start to think, you know, what, what might be the role of sleep and sleep loss in anxiety related disorders. Um, and so, you know, I really dug into the literature and I mean, there's an enormous basic science literature showing that sleep disruption, insufficient sleep has, you know, really broad consequences for physiological, mm -hmm. cognitive and affective function and systems that we need in anxiety disorders specifically. So, you know, it, it just made a lot of logical sense to me um, that, mm -hmm. that insufficient sleep, sleep disruption could be a contributing factor to mm -hmm. anxiety related disorders, including OCD. Mm -hmm. 
and I suppose like how so Meredith described 15 years ago, there wasn't a lot on OCD. Was there a big literature on anxiety disorders as it relates to sleep or depressive disorders? So the, the literature was, you know, more built out for the role of sleep and circadian rhythms in depression. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when, you know, when I started my graduate training about 10 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of, of research looking at sleep and circadian rhythms in anxiety related disorders. Mm -hmm. um, and so it felt like this, this real gap in the literature and a, a real kind of need to, mm -hmm. to understand more. Right. And the majority of the literature was looking at insomnia and we are finding like different differences, like Rebecca said, like sleep versus circadian rhythms that not getting enough sleep or having trouble falling asleep that, and what time you sleep all seem to be important, but potentially in different ways. And, and, uh, depression and bipolar and things were uh, like so schizophrenia. They were emphasizing more of the sleep timing. Um, so it seems like they're both might be important in your timing and how long you sleep and that type of thing. So. Yeah, but I was thinking back to the first couple of symposia we did, and everybody thought we were crazy. And everybody was like, what are you people doing? You know, people came up to my posters. I do posters, but like talking to people about them. And uh, people would come up, Jake remembers the book, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, so. That was yeah, a bit of fun. Biggest, biggest, big, yeah, was that like, um, even with Meredith's observation, right? Like, well, isn't this just a consequence of symptoms? was yeah. the big response I remember right. being very much there in the beginning and then around the time where I would be on symposium with Rebecca and, and we were doing research about the mechanisms we're like it really it's they interact but it seems like it's a two-way street and I think that was the, the um, when there started to be a lot more and now there is a lot more research about anxiety once we start realize oh yeah those mechanisms that you know what we know sleep does there's a lot of basic research about sleep it makes sense that it would feed back into mm -hmm. also making it harder to stop something you yeah. started or to yeah. um, not respond to something scary or something that grabs yeah. your attention. And and then, yeah. yeah, people were less like, oh, this must be all one way. It's like, yeah, yeah. it's a two-way street. Not that symptoms yeah. can't impact sleep, but they might right. mutually re reinforce right. it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, worst popped in there for a second. Um, so initially people's kind of like I guess critique of the work was that like obviously sleep plays a role insofar as like if you have bad symptoms you're just not going to get good sleep and like that was kind of the initial impression that that was the end of it yeah I think people assumed that it was you know you're staying up late <laughs> doing your compulsions and in some cases that might be the case like the case I talked about the first one we treated that was in her case why she stayed up but after that you know, and that does happen, but we're also really finding that the sleep disruptions lead to symptoms, make people more likely to have symptoms. And when we found, like Jake said, it's usually both directions, but the papers where we have found one, only one of the directions has actually always been that the sleep is driving the symptom. Um, so that's something we really looked at and it doesn't see, if anything, it seems to go the opposite way that most people would think. <laughs> have, so you guys have done like more experimental stuff where you yeah. can glean cause yeah. and effect. Oh, that's cool. Well, we've done like longitudinal things. So longitudinal, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we have a couple and it's always been that way. I don't mm. know. Yeah. Yeah. We've piloted um, light boxes. Um, use a light box to shift mm. your circadian rhythms. And we had good responses with that. So well, what was that study? We've um, piloted, it's only pilot data, but using light boxes so people get up earlier in the morning and they sit in front of a light box they can use for seasonal depression yeah. a lot and uh, we just use that no cbt or anything and uh, people have pretty substantial most of them had substantial reductions in their oc symptoms oh wow so, hmm, that's really interesting yeah. that is yeah. really cool yeah yeah I, so yeah. it sounds like there's more to this literature than meets the eye because like people you've thrown out the term like circadian rhythm and then i've oh, seen like sorry. sleep disturbances sleep efficiency like use yeah. it so like what are kind of like what things are typically measured how do you break down sleep when you're researching it and that's for anyone uh, yeah, Jake, I don't care. No, it's, it, you took the, I was just thinking, Kyle's like, oh, we're throwing around a bunch of terms yeah. that we didn't talk about. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so um, you could broadly, without going super deep into it, one major division would be kind of between homeostatic sleep and uh, sleep drive and circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are like about a 24 hour day 
rhythm. So that's like your body clock. The thing you'll notice when after daylight savings time, you're like, I feel <laughs> less tired, even though the clock is you know moved up or whatever. Um, or if you mm -hmm. get jet lag, that's a, you know stuff that you're noticing that you have an internal clock that doesn't just shift because the clock on the wall changed. Um, and so that's part of what impacts when you sleep and when you feel sleepy. Um, but it also does some, um, it, it's 24 hours. It's not just when you sleep, it affects when you're um, more uh, alert and more able to do certain kinds of things cognitively during the day. And it works in opposition really in tandem with the homeostatic sleep drive, which is the thing that I think most people think of. I've been awake for a long time, I'm tired. You know, and that's usually, mm -hmm. you need about eight hours of sleep per, you know, 24 hours a um, day. And there's more to it, but the, a lot of times people are trying to measure things that kind of capture bits of some of this will measure some circadian rhythm stuff. And that's usually like um, either questionnaires that try to get at that, or if they can, they'll directly measure like melatonin secretion, which is a hormone that your body secretes in a circadian rhythm or cortisol or sometimes things like that. Um, and then we do ask about, yeah, sleep behaviors, like how much sleep you're getting when um, you get in bed, how long does it take you to fall asleep? That's something that has to do with that sleep efficiency, how much time you're spending trying to sleep versus sleeping. Um, oh. I, I'm not covering all of it, but I don't know if Rebecca or Meredith have more to say, but yeah, there's a lot of different pieces because sleep is not one thing. It's a bunch of systems, biological systems that control when you sleep and when you feel awake. Right. Yeah, I think that was a great summary. And, and mm -hmm. I think just to make the point that like, there's sleep and then there's circadian rhythms, your biological mm -hmm. clock. And these are related, but independent um, physiological processes. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of overlap, but these are um, independent systems. Yeah. And but, but like the circadian rhythm, the biological clock and mm -hmm. sleep as in like sleep efficiency, architecture, disruption, all that stuff. They're both associated with OCD, maybe in different ways. <laughs> Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So there's there's kind of a signal that delayed circadian rhythms or having a later biological clock is kind of a signal for OCD or is characteristic of OCD. Um, and then there's separately also evidence that you know shorter sleep duration, insomnia, these kind of general sleep disruptions are are also drivers of OCD. Hmm. Okay. What, what do we? If I could jump in, what what do we know about how specific that is to OCD mm -hmm. versus other problems with anxiety or other kind of psychiatric disorders mm -hmm. in general? I would say that it seems uh, that we don't. I, this is not a fact yet, but in our data, it seems as if obsessions and cognitive getting stuck, ruminating, worrying, obsessing in in the real sense of the word seem to be more of the um, homeostatic, like getting enough sleep and what, and how long it takes you to fall asleep, more insomnia kind of, the cognitive kind of loops, where to us compulsions, the compulsions and behaviors that you kind of get stuck with seem to be more the circadian. Yeah. Um, circadian is also related to um, psychosis, to uh, autism, um, to bipolar. It, it seems like it might be that that's more trouble not acting on urges or resisting, but that's really early. Like that's just it's the thing we were, it might be noticing, but we have to study that. So it could be that different parts of OCD map differently to the different types of sleep and circadian disruption. But it sounds like there's like no clear, it, it's sleep disruptions and, and changes in your circadian rhythm maybe aren't specific to disrupt like OCD. They, they might underlie a bunch of different pathologies. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think I think that's true. I think sleep disruption and yeah. circadian rhythm disruption are. Yeah. I think we can consider these transdiagnostic yeah. factors broadly. Yeah. I mean, we, we see these kinds of signals but, across, you know, lots yeah. of different forms of psychopathology. But mm -hmm. I will say, you know, I, I do think relative to the other anxiety-related disorders, mm -hmm. we see as a, a more unique signal for delayed circadian right. rhythms in OCD versus yeah. you know disorders yeah. like PAD or, or right. PTSD. Right. phobias or stuff like that yeah. you would imagine yeah. Yeah. right neat right. this oh, may yeah. be like a dumb question but like <laughs> why like if if my body tells me to go to sleep mm -hmm. at 12 p.m rather than 10 p.m okay. like is that is is that what you mean by delayed circadian rhythm like i just naturally get tired a little bit later mm -hmm. like what what does that have to do with ocd <laughs> well it has to do with if you don't sleep at the right time 
if you're if when you sleep doesn't match sunlight the, the light dark cycle mm -hmm. then your body gets thrown off and it has a harder time doing things ideally you sleep when it's dark out right like okay. that's the ideal one of the best things that everyone ever told me is what what does the term midnight mean what do you think it means do you know what midnight means I would say 12 Yeah, <laughs> Middle of the night. Is the best. I was Middle thinking. of the night. So you should sleep equal parts before and after midnight. Interesting, yeah. That's how our bodies are set up. So you should huh. be awake when it's light and asleep when it's dark. And if you're not, your body kind of gets thrown off because it has patterns to it. There's a reason people take their naps in the middle of the afternoon because you're, it's when you know your body's prepared to do it. Um, so it's it just... It causes a mismatch between your sleep and the light dark cycle, and that throws off all different types of things, not just psychiatric, but a lot of processes in your body. Huh. That makes sense, Kyle. Yeah, well, I certainly, I would. Yeah. Justification yeah. to take a nap right now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you ask and I, I would add. I think that there's, um, like, first of all. That is the that's the question I've been interested. In. I know Rebecca is very interested in that too, like figuring out how the why is this question. working. Yeah, the why, and and I think the real answer is we're figuring it all out, of yeah. course, but or hoping to. And then, um, but I I think the what I often say to people is you know that's um, maybe the environment these systems evolved in, like bi biological circadian rhythms. Flies have them. You know, like it, it's a very yeah. basic part of having a nervous system, mm -hmm. and so it's not. Um, we don't live in an environment necessarily where that's always what people do, right? Like the average person today is probably not getting up at 4 a.m. and going to bed at 8 p.m., right? Um, but they, probably. Uh, you know, our bodies are set up in a way we go, oh, it's light out and it's taking in light as a signal to tell the biological clock when to do these things. And so someone who's really delayed, a lot of times what I, I think of it as is like, there's been this disconnection between what the environment's giving you and what your body's doing now. Mm -hmm. and, and Meredith's pointing out, and your body is stressed in some way by trying to catch up all the time. Um, and maybe yeah. also you're asking yourself, your brain and your body to do certain things that it's just at that point, like not like if your body's like, this is my circadian night, I'm not very good at inhibiting stuff, but you're going, I'd really like to stop doing this action right now. You might be like fighting an uphill battle um, mm -hmm. that away in a way. So when we correct some of these things and we say, hey, use this light box or um, try to get into a more regular circadian rhythm mm -hmm because maybe you have none, you're just kind of like going to sleep whenever you feel exhausted. Um, we're hoping basically that we can kind of align things so that it just makes it, you know, a, like there's a little bit more of a platform for you to stand on to do something we know is already hard. Like, you know, if you have OCD inhibiting, uh, you know, doing a compulsion or, you know, putting your attention on something that you value and, and letting go of something that's scaring the crap out of you right now. Um, and I think to me, that's often the, how is it doing it? Whether that starts like the sleep started first or the symptoms started first, I never know because I always meet people at the point where they have both going on. But, mm -hmm. um, but I think, and that's to John's question about experimentation, like there are experimental mm -hmm. studies about some of this. And I think we need more to, to figure out like what pushes mm -hmm. what around. But, yeah. um, but in the clinic, often it's that, it's like, you know, you know, it's much, much harder. And like Meredith, I always think about mm -hmm. Meredith's first case study about that. I mean, like mm -hmm. we, we saw she moved that thing and then it was mm -hmm. still hard for that person to do this. Like her symptoms didn't just erase or anything, but, they were, mm -hmm. it was different and she felt like she right. had a little more room to do something yeah. that yeah. Meredith was talking to her about like changing her behavior. This and yeah. so that's why I usually think about it. It's like, you're now, you're just kind of at a disadvantage. You're not, you're not aligned with what you're asking or the environment's asking you to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. now my kids all need me to do something, but my body clock is like, you should be asleep. That's how. Yeah. yeah. Um, make the, that's oh, like such a sorry, great no. answer. Oh no, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I was no, just no. gonna say, um, I think that's like a really great description. And mm -hmm. the I two little points I want to add are, you know, first, like the the adaptive value of having a circadian rhythm, of having a biological mm -hmm. clock, is that it allows us to anticipate changes yeah. in our environment, changes in environmental mm -hmm. demands, right? Rather than to just be this reactive organism that, you know, the, the sun comes up and, and now we react to that. We anticipate mm -hmm. those changes because of our biological clock. And so if our, our clock is misaligned or you know delayed, we've lost some of that adaptive value of having the clock. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, you know, this, this question of like, okay, so if there is this signal for, you know, delayed circadian rhythms and OCD, you know, 
why? What like why is that specific to OCD or what does that tell us? And and I totally agree with Jake. I mean, the the why is still a big question mark. But I think you know what we may be able to take from this is this idea of okay, if if our if our, if our biological clock is misaligned with the light dark cycle or with you know the the environment that we need to be operating in maybe that tells us something about the biological mechanisms of OCD, right? Maybe there's something really important physiologically about, you know, mm-hmm. alignment, whether that's, you know, with, with, you know, the melatonin rhythm, the cortisol rhythm, you know, that may be able to point us to some, you know, interesting and novel questions about biological mechanisms. Mm-hmm. Well, and probably even more general, I, I love that point, probably more, even more generally than that, just, you know, uh, when, when we're, when we're tired, we're mm-hmm. not cognitively at our at mm-hmm. our best, right? And right. so it probably has something to do with not just OCD, but just in general, our cognitive yeah. or psychological functioning yeah. um, most yeah. definitely is is tied yeah. to uh, right. you know, yeah, circadian rhythm and and mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. There are papers showing that just disruption of circadian rhythm causes more intrusive thoughts in just anyone in normal populations. Um, there's been some pretty big articles showing that recently too. So I, the, when we treat people, when we've shifted people's schedule, it's interesting because they all, they report the or questionnaires and things. When you ask them questions, it seems as if they're, um, they don't feel as compelled to respond to their urges right away. So mm-hmm. the measures show that they're like not, in, not engaging in their, in their compulsions as much. And, but they don't kind of realize that. So every, all the self-reports will come out that way. But if you interview them and talk to them, they won't report that. But then about two weeks later, they'll get insight and they'll start reporting that. So it's interesting. Like on the questionnaires, we see and ratings, we see they're changing. But the, then they don't report it until two, like two weeks later, usually. So it's like then they start saying, well, I had an urge and I was about to do my compulsion, but something happened and I got distracted. I, I never ended up doing it. And they're like surprised because they've never, they've always responded. And then, but it takes them a while to recognize it. So that's kind of interesting. It's just, I mean, it's just an observation in a couple people, but, you know, it was pretty consistent across people that we shifted their time. So that's something we could look into. Like, it's not that they were better at resisting. It was like, they didn't feel the urge to respond right away didn't override other things in the world the way it usually does. Mm-hmm. So. That, that kind of got a like a question I was thinking of. If if you tell like have patients kind of correct their circadian rhythm, yeah. which I don't know like how one does that if that's super yeah. difficult, how long that takes. Um, someone I think asked, yeah, yeah, someone asked in the chat at twelve twenty six tips on shifting your biological clock, which I'd love to hear you guys um, okay. explain some tips, and then also like does that change treatment outcomes in some way and, and what about for, mm-hmm. it, yeah and what about for folks that like work the third shift those late shifts yeah yeah there's yeah, a lot so, of questions yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so so trying to shift your biological clock um you know it is it's challenging but doable um so the the primary time cue for our biological clock or our circadian rhythm is light exposure and so we know from basic, you know, sleep and circadian science, if we get a lot of light exposure in the morning, that's going to shift our clock earlier. If we get a lot of light exposure in the evening, that's going to shift our clock later. And so we can leverage, you know, those those light entrainment principles in light therapy, right? So if, if I ask you to, you know, sit in front of a light box in the morning or use wearable light therapy glasses, or even, you know, go outside and go for a walk, get natural light exposure in the morning, that can be helpful for shifting the clock earlier. Um, and likewise, you know, we, we want to increase morning light, but it's also important to decrease evening light exposure, right? Mm-hmm. So trying to keep lights dim, you know, in the couple hours before bedtime, limiting um, light exposure from devices, you know, so we can, we can kind of hit the system from, from both directions, mm-hmm. increasing morning light and decreasing evening light. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and my I think, dream yeah, is that there are secondary big- clocks, but the light <laughs> is the biggest one. That's what I usually talk to most of the people. About. I was just gonna say, my <laughs> grandmother's dream is that we could actually use light boxes to help people with OCD. And I think we're not there yet, but that's my dream because it wouldn't be, you wouldn't need advanced training. You wouldn't need to spend a lot of money. You wouldn't need to find exposure therapy. Like even if we could make a dent in OCD, the 
you can buy light boxes on Amazon for ninety dollars. <laughs> like, and you know, someone can teach you how to use it, but it could be a treatment if it helps. It could be widely disseminated a lot more easily and a lot more cheaply. So that's kind of my dream is that it could lead to something we could, you know, it could be like stepped care. You could try this first or, or, you know, but it'd be a lot easier to disseminate than training everyone and getting everybody to understand how good exposure is, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's my grandiose dream because <laughs> we can help more people. Jake, you, you mentioned the term <laughs> secondary clock. What, what does that refer to? Um, the only way I should say like, uh, the term they use in the research is zeitgeist, but like time givers, uh, so things that are like the metronomes that your circadian clock listens to. Light is a huge one, but activity, eating, mm -hmm. um, things like that also send a signal. So if you eat around regular mm -hmm. times, that'll help your body get into a routine. If you are active mm -hmm. at particular times and not active at others, those also are signals that you're your circadian clock listens to along with light. Um, so I talked to people about that exactly like Rebecca said, like you can use a light box, you do things like that, but it could be turn down the lights in the evening, try to do anything different than stare at your phone. Um, even if you turn on the blue light thing, it's not that that totally erases the effect of staring at your phone, but like some of these things you can do can help. And uh, yeah, in the morning, open the shades, let the light in, uh, go for a walk in the morning, stuff like that is mm -hmm. all practical um, stuff mm -hmm. to move your clock. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, there's some, um, like, like Rebecca said, it's, it's not always easy for people. And a lot of times when I meet with people, um, I'm very thoughtful that, um, you know, sort of pitching is like, these things work, they do, but it's not always easy to make that kind of a thing work for you and fit into your mm -hmm. life. And, um, there's some evidence too, perhaps that people who have more, have a tendency toward delayed sleep phase, like might have less responsive clocks. Um, mm -hmm. that they're, you know, it's going to have to work harder and get more signals than an average person to stay in line with, um, the sleep during the night and wake during the day schedule. Um, yeah. oh. so you might find like, Hey, I'm doing that stuff, but I still drift late. You know, that might be a time where we go, Oh, like we might want to think more about, can we stack some of these up or the mm -hmm. other extra, um, things mm -hmm. you'll, you'll need to, to use maybe compared to just some other person who's like, oh yeah, like the sun shifted earlier in the day and I started waking up earlier and that just happened without me really trying to. And, um, that kind of stuff. Yeah, why, like why wouldn't that be on a continuum, right? Of how easy it is right. to shift mm -hmm. your biological. What about for, and you know, I see this in, in my clinical work, um, probably most folks do if you work with OCD, folks who, and it's often, you know, your younger folks who stay up late mm -hmm. maybe because of their OCD and then they're sleep, you know, they're sleeping mm -hmm. during the day, they're going to bed at night, their parents are like, our kid is always asleep during the day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good question, Johnny. You brought up uh, shift workers too. And I think there's these naturally occurring subgroups that are more prone to it. Another one is pregnancy, the, the shifts that occur with that, or yeah. people um, starting residencies like or ER docs, you know, there's a bunch of like naturally occurring populations that would be great to study. And it's just, we haven't got there yet because we're growing in people who think this is a valid topic, <laughs> but you know, it just takes time. And I think they're all populations we need to look at, you know? So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it's, there's a lot of groups we can look at the impact. And a shift work you brought up, I mean, honestly, I would try to see if they go on vacation or if they before were they different before they start shift work. But you know, ultimately, maybe it's not ideal for someone with OCD to do shift work. You know, like we don't know yet. We have to study that. Um, but I think there are are these naturally occurring populations that would be great to help us understand what's happening. You know. Yeah. Cool. And let's say like you're kind of successful a, a given person is in allowing aligning their biological clock with the sun let's say um it, what's the evidence tying that to changes in treatment outcome or, or other studies around yet um i don't you guys you have some data jake don't you <laughs> um i was to say i have some data that are from a very specific context at uh, mclean hospital where we have a, a residential treatment unit for people who have the OCD and other uh, OCD related disorders. Um, so we have some data from a 
study that was funded by the ICDF actually to collect um, melatonin. And because of what I was saying before, melatonin is something your body produces in a cycle. We actually, what we would do is have people when they start um, at the OCDI in the first week, we would have a night where we would keep them up at the time where we think their body's going to go from not producing melatonin to producing melatonin. And we would measure that point. When did that happen? That, sh that shift. Mm -hmm. And then we did it the second week and then we did it the fourth week. And then we did it when they left. And, you know, the goal of that study was to, um, you know, measure that along with self-report, uh, you know, data about their, when they're going to sleep. Um, the OCDI also had the, the, unit there at McLean also has a structure where, you know, people are asked to be in bed in their rooms at a certain time in the day. They have to be up for a particular meeting first thing in the morning. So there's sort of an imposed um, circadian rhythm intervention on everyone who's there. Uh, so we were curious, like, as people go through this treatment, we know we get a lot of people, like Meredith was saying, observing a lot of people who come here who have delayed sleep phase. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it's somewhere in the 30 to 40% of mm -hmm. the patients who started at the OCDI were describing going to bed after 1 a.m. regularly, mm -hmm. even if they got a, a um, duration of sleep that was not short, like, you know, in the seven to eight hours range. So it was pretty prevalent, much, much more prevalent than you would see just if you asked 100 people on the street or whatever, when do they go to bed? Um, and so we know it would shift being there and so we're not really doing an experimental like everyone but some groups getting a shift and some people are not um so it's more just longitudinal like we can see when shifts in their biological clock might be happening and does that coincide with follow changes in symptoms how does that relate to what they're doing in treatment because everyone's also getting treatment um, and what we found was uh, that in the beginning of treatment, so right when you get there through the first couple weeks, there's a relationship um, where having to shift more, sorry, I'm going slow because I want to make sure I say it the right way because it was a um, kind of analysis that was kind of trickier, but go, if you had to shift more from your biological cl clock was shifting more than your treatment was um, your symptom improvement was greater in the very beginning of treatment, but then it became such that after that, it went the other way. Like if you were shifting more from like week four on till, or two to four. So like the, the um, second sort of portion of getting into treatment, if you were shifting more at that point, your symptoms were not getting better, um, as much. Everyone was getting better overall, but the, the rate of that was different. So in that context for example there was a relationship where they were um you know we're not showing that doing this causes a change in those but they were coinciding and i know there have been other people doing similar kinds of things where you look at like what's happening at the same time or you know um and meredith mentioned pilot data about uh, what happens to treatment or symptoms when you uh, do a sleep intervention but that's one example the kind of thing that we've been doing trying to go past the point of just asking people like when did you sleep and now going more towards so what's your actual biological clock doing because that's not the same as when you slept or when right. you felt like you were sleeping yeah and then in some and of, that, there's um, a better description of that in the iocdf newsletter by the way that i wrote <laughs> so if you're like curious about it go read what i wrote <laughs> apparently wrote people are reading than... yeah <laughs> yeah um, yeah, and I was just going to add um, in in some of my ongoing work, which is funded by the IOCDF, we are conducting a pilot randomized controlled trial of light therapy for OCD. Um, so doing kind of what I described earlier, you know, increasing morning light mm -hmm. through wearable light therapy glasses, and then decreasing evening light by asking people to be in dim light um, for the couple hours before bedtime. Um, and the the placebo version here in this trial um, is a placebo wearable light therapy glasses. So we install like multiple layers of neutral density filters over the bulbs to create a placebo device. So it looks visibly the exact same as the active device, but the light level that's being emitted is substantially lower. Mm -hmm. um, and so th this is ongoing, we, we, you know, we're still collecting data, but what we're seeing right now in this trial is that those who are in the active treatment condition are reporting um, large effects for decreased daily intrusive cognition um, compared to those in the placebo condition. So we have some promising results so far, but stay tuned for final results yeah. later on. I that's love cool. that. 
That's that's yeah. really creative. Um, are they getting any sort of like drug behavior therapy, anything like that as well, or is it just the light therapy? Great question. So there, yeah, there's there's no drug. There's no like we're not you know administering exogenous melatonin. Um, there's no traditional you know psychotherapy for OCD. So no ERP or CBT. Um, the only other addition to the active treatment condition is that we ask them to keep a fixed wake time. So we're kind of stabilizing sleep timing in addition to uh, targeting the light exposure. Ah, that's really cool. When will you have, uh, how many, what's your sample size going to be? So <laughs> goal sample <laughs> size is 30. Um, so 15 and 15. Um, we, we've had a, a tougher time recruiting post COVID. Um, but right now we have six and five. Very cool. Okay. So you got, you got some ways to go, but that's, you know, no one's done a study like that before. So that'll be really, yeah. really cool. Yeah. Is this kind of the first randomized control trial looking at something related to sleep in OCD? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I think so. Well, there's been some adolescent work in Australia, um, yeah, but I, that's all I can think of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there I, have, I, well, there has been um, data. I don't. I don't know if it's exactly. I have, just haven't thought it all through. But there's data showing that repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation that people with delayed time, sleep timing don't respond to RTMS. So that's actually a randomized trial. So that would actually count. Um, but there's very little, you know, uh, but that was interesting that the people with delayed sleep didn't respond to RTMS um, where people with regular did. Um, and that was a randomized trial. Um, so yeah, not, there's not much. We definitely, this oh, is Rebecca. Rebecca's it's what the study we need. <laughs> so it's really exciting. Yeah. I'm like, how's it going? Show me the data. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's exciting. It's very cool. And, and that's the Genike grant? Yes. Rebecca? Well, it's, okay. it's, it's part of my Genike grant. I, I have so I have another funding source as well that I've kind of combined to create a, a larger project than either. Kind of support it. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah. And Jacob, your was the study you described your um, Genike grant? <laughs> Yes, my early investigator work. Yes, exactly. And I feel you, Rebecca, on the recruitment. It was, it was a one-year study. It took three years. <laughs> yeah. It happened during 2020 till 2023. <laughs> um, but that's so awesome. Yeah. I, um, I guess like I'm I'm still as like the the resident layman, um, a little confused like what to make of of all that that data and those findings that were just presented to me. Like if I'm thinking about how to change like will changing my sleeping patterns change my treatment it doesn't sound like there's too much causal evidence yet um and there's some associations but like how would you summarize it for someone like me well one thing i would bring up is what's the risk of going to bed an hour earlier right so most i get treatment... to watch less youtube it's no awesome. you can record it and watch the next day just get up early and watch it instead of setting up late but I think that's one of the things I like about this. It's pretty hard. To, I mean, if someone's bipolar, you need to pay attention. And there are some medical conditions where, you know, the light might not, light boxes might not be a good match for if you have some eye problems. But in general, like the risk of going to bed an hour earlier is pretty low compared to the potential benefit, you know? So we do need to study it. We do need to know how it works. But I love how easy it is to disseminate and try it. If it helps to you, great. If it doesn't, you know, it's not a big cost. It's not a big investment. You know, uh, so, but I wasn't trying to not answer your question, but I think about that a lot. Like the benefits, uh, the risk benefit ratio is pretty good, I think. Yeah. 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 Fair know? point. Yeah. And yeah, I, I would add too. to like, oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, Jake. Oh, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> no, I'll, 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 on that point about like, um, potential cost to return. A lot of times um, what I think about too is like that there can be a route where if someone was feeling like I want to do something that could potentially help me and right. starting ERP might be inaccessible or it's, um, right. you know, maybe overwhelming my motivation, my willingness isn't there yet. You know, the right. things we're talking about are cognitive behavioral kinds of things to do to be like, yeah, what's it going to be like to decide to watch YouTube tomorrow morning instead? You know, why yeah. would you be motivated to do this differently? Right. You know, you're, you're right. starting to interact with your own behavior and your own experience, one foot in, one foot out, just like you'll do 
later. And if it did make an impact and you're feeling good and it helps you get into doing the ERP part, that'd be awesome. Maybe it would have an impact without you ever having to do ERP, maybe. But yeah. a lot of times I think about it that way. It's like, yeah, this is great. Like if you're motivated to work on sleep, let's work on sleep. Cause like Merit's saying, I think it probably would make most people, you know, um, have some, some quality right. of life improvement if they want it. And then yeah. it could also lead into, you know, right. Hey, I'm doing this. I'm, I changed something that was a big deal. Like my, a pattern I've been doing for a long time. And now maybe I could try something else too. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm researching. For, oh, go ahead. Meredith. I was going to say, there's so many things that we're finding were related to circadian rhythms. Yeah. Is, that it couldn't, they could help a lot of other things. Like we're finding that circadian rhythm, like staying up late makes chemotherapy in a lot, markedly less effective. Wounds heal quicker if you're cut during the day than if you're awake late at night and get cut. Like the average hospital stay goes from like four to seven days up to almost 20 days. If you get, if you cut yourself at night versus during the day, it's, you know, related to chemo or to uh, cancer or like that. It's related to insulin processing. Like there's so much data coming out that being up in the middle of the night is not healthy in a lot of other ways that it could help be helpful in other ways that you wouldn't even think of. You know, but if you happen to get cut during the day, it's a lot better than getting cut at night. You know, there's just such a wide net of data coming out. I think, I mean, it makes, it makes total sense from what uh, Rebecca was saying. We were all yeah. kind of talking about earlier on about yeah. how, you know, we, we are not nocturnal animals you know we're, we're right. meant to sleep during the night right. and uh, and so things just work better we're yeah. we're we're primed to function better our, yeah. our eyes work better you know photoscopic yeah. versus yeah. you know photo versus mm -hmm. scototopic i forget what yeah. it is <laughs> but like yeah. right our eyes work better for yeah. seeing things in the light than in the dark um yeah. it's, it's yeah. fascinating fascinating it's stuff really yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we there were a couple questions in the chat. I want to turn to the chat yeah. to do our I guess some good. Um, people were asking about like how medication might interact with sleep, and I mm -hmm. suppose just medic like I, I'll pitch that to you as an open topic. Actually, how does medication interact with sleep? Well, it depends on the medication, but you know one of the, one of the um, clearest signals for medication impacting sleep um, or impacting. Yeah, psychiatric outcomes that's relevant to this discussion is most antidepressant medications, including medications that are commonly prescribed for OCD, um, affect REM sleep. Um, so oftentimes in depression, we see kind of a signal, and, and we actually see this a little bit in OCD as well, a signal for kind of REM pressure. Um, so more time spent in REM, going into REM sleep quicker, um, having a, um, a, a denser um, intensity of the rapid eye movements themselves. And there, there's good evidence that antidepressant medications kind of re relieve that REM pressure effect. So um, decreased time in REM, taking longer to go into REM, reducing the intensity or the density of the rapid eye movements. Um, so that's kind of one major kind of uh, medication effect on, on sleep that's relevant here. Mm -hmm. And is that you said antidepressants? I have a couple questions about that actually. Antidepressant, like which, which ones? SSRIs, tricyclics, like SSRIs. Like almost every SSRI has that that REM effect. Mm -hmm. And it's always been in my head that like getting more REM sleep is a good thing. So, you mm -hmm. saying that people with OCD go into REM quicker? That sounds not terrible, but. I mean, what's the take on that? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not like necessarily, oh, that's, that's a bad thing, but that, you know, that could be kind of pointing to some sort of, you know, underlying physical mechanism that's driving changes in REM. Um, the, you know, similar to what we said before, the why here isn't really known. Um, but there, there is kind of some theorizing that that may be one of the, the mechanisms of action of SSRIs is that mm -hmm. they are kind of reducing that, that REM intensity and bringing back, bringing that back to what we would expect to see in a healthy person. Interesting. You were talking about the comments and I was just going to have someone ask um, a question about when people in the North uh, differences and they asked about the summer differences. Yeah. We actually did a paper and yeah, to that. be full, what's that? I, I remember seeing that paper. Yeah, it, and it was just kind of a fun to look at, but it, some people have criticized our methodology, which is fine. Like they said, we didn't use the sample they would have used. Like, but um, we found that people that live 
countries that are closer to the equator had lower rates of OCD than countries further from the equator. So assuming that people closer to the equator get more sunlight, we just thought it'd be you know, interesting to look at. And we found a really strong correlation between latitude and rates of OCD. So that is really fascinating. I mean, there are lots of factors that could account for right. that, but sleep right. is certainly, you know, the daylight and all that, that's certainly one yeah. of them. Yeah, we like looked at hours of light at latitude, but you know, and we control for some of some of the things that were like these would be yep. thoughtful, yep. you know, to include. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think too that uh, with Rebecca, the question about the. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I think the thing for sleep, just that I want to plug here, that I won't be able to say enough for everyone to like have the final word on it, but but when it comes to like sleep architecture, meaning like how much time you're in slow wave sleep or short wave sleep or um, till in REM, it really it's not that any one of them is like this is good. You want as much of it as possible. It's it's a balance. Like your your brain goes through a bunch of cycles of those things because it needs all of them. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. you know, that REM pressure, like Rebecca was talking about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, being different, that's the kind of thing, like, we don't know exactly why, especially with sleep, it's kind of shocking when you look sometimes, like we know so much about how to describe what's happening. And someone's like, well, what is that thing, a reflection? Like, I'm kind of, I don't know, like it, but we can measure it really well with an EEG. And so we we look for it and we pay attention to it. Um, but I think often about, um, REM is responsive, like it's a thing your brain is doing that has something to do with consolidating memories and processing emotional experiences you have during the day um, and kind of like putting things back so that you're ready for the next learning the next day. Um, and so maybe some increased pressure to do that, doing a lot more of that is, you know, related to or connecting with like I'm having more of a drive to need to try to process a bunch of this stuff and i'm not getting through it and my brain wants to do more of it and is sacrificing the stuff it needs to do with these other things like slow wave sleep which is helpful and you know kind of more like physical restoration and feeling more awake and you know like you get that from slow wave sleep so so it's not necessarily that you always want like a ton of one or or the other it's it's a balance and things being out yeah. of balance is the thing we're kind of all like oh i wonder what happens when things are out of balance but it seems pretty opaque like once you try to dig into like what does it mean to be not in slow wave sleep for that long right um yeah and i guess subtle differences right it's not this this person doesn't ever slow wave sleep you might get someone who's like they spend 20 percent of their time there versus 40 percent while they're asleep or something because your brain does all of these things uh every time you yeah. sleep. yeah it's it's interesting but complicated <laughs> um yeah and then I guess we spent a lot of time talking about circadian rhythm and I had like a host, I have a document of questions and there's a whole bunch of questions about like sleep efficiency and like, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, um, which I don't, are those related to circadian rhythm? I, I don't know if that's like kind of the same topic. Well, I would say they're related. I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if you're trying to sleep at a time that it's not consistent with your biological clock, you're going to have a harder time sleeping, right? So it's okay. going to take you longer to fall asleep. Your sleep will probably be more disrupted. You might wake up more in the night and that's going to then result in, in lower sleep efficiency. So sleep efficiency is just um, the ratio of the time that you spend asleep to the time that you spend in bed. Um, you know, so you, you want that ratio to be like, you know, if you turn into a percentage, like 85 90 or, or higher. So you want to be spending the majority of the time that you're actually in bed, actually sleeping. Um, but for people who have like, for example, insomnia, they typically have lower sleep efficiency because they're spending excessive time in bed trying to sleep, but they take longer to fall asleep and they wake up more in the night. Um, and so, yes, like that, that would be related to the circadian rhythm. You know, if you're trying to sleep at a time that's really not consistent with your clock. So like when you look at sleep efficiency and OCD, like let's say you're looking at circadian rhythm, delayed circadian rhythm, and you control for sleep efficiency, does that change the results at all? Or how does sleep efficiency relate to OCD? I think I would say, I, I think of sleep efficiency as a clinical tool that was developed for cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. They, they needed some way to, to help people guide themselves on doing things like stimulus control and, and sleep restriction, basically saying, you want that to get higher and the way we do it is not you better sleep more but instead of being like get out of bed don't be in bed for very long because that's mm -hmm. actually building up an association between bed and not sleeping and so you'll get in bed and you'll be stressed and you won't sleep mm -hmm. 
and so it's it's a thing that people measure and it's easy to measure so people look at it but it's mm -hmm. not really a reflection of like that's a that's what your, your body does it's it's kind of like a the broadest measure of how much time are you trying to sleep to how much time are you sleeping. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so you people people report it and then there are definitely papers where people like look for differences in sleep efficiency between people who have ocd and people who don't or something but to me it's like that tells me almost nothing about why is it because they're in bed super early is it because they're in bed super late is because they're waking up a ton during the night all of those would make sleep efficiency low and any three those could be because of hyperarousal those could be because of circadian rhythms those could be because of slow like low sleep drive like any of those things um, so it's more of a clinical tool than it is a um, mm -hmm. mechanism mm -hmm. yeah. okay so i guess there's less questions asked about like how sleep efficiency or sleep disruptions may be associated with some facet of ocd So I, I, I don't know if you guys see different things. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There, there's, it's tricky. I mean, there, there's the potentially some value to kind of breaking sleep down into okay. these like really you know specific variables. Um, but you know, ultimately, I'm I'm not sure that I would expect there to be like oh you know sleep onset latency or how long it takes you to fall asleep is really like the sleep thing for OCD versus they're just kind of being an overall signal for disturbed sleep, whether that's problems falling asleep, problems staying asleep. Um, you know, I, I feel like more of a, a global sleep perspective is is probably more helpful than kind of trying to pinpoint like, oh, which which specific piece of sleep is, is the driver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely good to have clarified because I was here thinking that like we should think about each individual facet of <laughs> sleep. Um, <laughs> But I mean, one thing I've taken away from this conversation is like circadian rhythm is w a way more powerful and all encompassing mm -hmm. topic than I would have ever imagined yep. it to be. Yeah, we agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> someone asked really briefly in the chat. Um, they're they're confused about the discussion of SSRIs. Is and they asked, is it good to reduce REM sleep through SSRIs? Is it detrimental to lose REM sleep because of SSRIs? Just thought I'd have you guys answer that to clear it up. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, I, so, I mean, my my impression of the literature is is that there's a sense that excessive time spent in REM is kind of a, a marker of psychopathology broadly, and decreasing that excess may be one of the ways that antidepressants work. Um, so, I think it's probably a good thing. Okay. Have There's you also heard a couple comments about? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I think you're gonna Prozac eyes, and no, I, I, I I looked it up. I have, a couple people have mentioned it. The common occurrence of slow rolling eye movements during non-REM sleep in patients taking fluoxetine Prozac has led to this finding being referred to as Prozac eyes. The ocular oh. movements in patients on fluoxetine are accompanied by an increase in myoclonic activity. Yeah. I've not I've never heard of that. I also don't do a lot with uh, medications, though. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of that. Um, I mean, slow rolling eye movements are um, like a, a marker of falling asleep. So that's something that you will see characteristically on EEG when someone is making the, initi uh, the initiation from wake to the earliest stage of sleep. Uh -huh. um, so that's like, that's not something that's like weird <laughs> in general in sleep. Um, and, and that is different than the rapid eye movements that you see in REM. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with like a specific effect of, of Prozac on slow rolling eye movements. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with um, the medication part for sure. But yeah, it's the same. I would have said the same thing as Rebecca about that kind of thing. My economy means like as you're falling asleep in that process of going into the early stages of sleep. So maybe it's it, like it, people are staying in that longer or coming back to that more frequently because yeah. you do every cycle, you go back into the shallow end of the sleep pool and then go yeah. all the way back to the deep. So maybe that there's a redistribution of how much time you're spending yeah. in that. Sleep's really, uh, it's really fascinating. What, has anyone ever done like an EMA study with, you know, asking folks, you know, how was your sleep last night? Oh, sorry, we, psychological we, momentary assessment. Where we you- We proposed them to NIMH, but haven't gotten funded for one yet. We're 
Revise it. Shame on them for not funding. So we'll see. You know, you, you know, you you get you get little um, reminders on these things yep. like, how did you sleep last night? And tell me yeah. about your OCD, yeah. you know, symptoms today. We've done the- it like paper and pencil, kind of you know, smaller versions, and that's yeah. the data where we were able to show that changes in uh, sleep were leading to changes in symptoms, you know, over time. But yeah. we could do them better <laughs> with money. <laughs> Yeah. We have some pilot data at McLean also that we were doing an EMA study and they let mm-hmm. me add sleep questions, <laughs> but we have very you know, <laughs> yeah. small yeah. sample and again, just within yeah. our really specific group of people mm-hmm. in treatment. I'm interested in seeing too, what are the kind of state effects of staying up late one night or two nights right. versus yeah. someone who really has a delayed sleep phase that they've had for 20 years or 50 years, you know, yeah. some of the dose effects and pulling apart state you know, versus trait, like if you stay up late, you know, I don't know if you have thoughts about that, Rebecca, but like is the cumulative effects versus the short term effects? I don't know if you have thoughts about that, but. Yeah, so it's it's something that I'm kind of collecting some data on now. Um, yeah. So yeah. in my in my current project, we do a, like a, a melatonin assessment, like right. Jake was saying, where you're right. trying to capture that melatonin onset. Right. And to do that, we ask people to stay up two hours later than usual so we can make sure that we're capturing that onset. And we are collecting data on OCD symptoms and repetitive negative thinking hourly during that assessment. So we we may be able to kind of ask that kind of question. Yeah. Oh, OK. We actually have some data like for when we did did like all total that we have like four hours before and two hours after. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did like repeated uh, reports of their symptoms and then we also did like uh, the response to the admission task, but we haven't looked at it. <laughs> we should look at it, Jake. You know, I wonder if we would answer when I was there. That was my was that? time that way back. Yeah, yeah. We have it. There's so much data, you know. But, we got to we got to wrap up because we're at time. I wonder if it would impact like insight, you know, with, yeah. which we know kind of varies. I think that. Yeah, would. yeah. That's yeah there's definitely. Talk. It seems like this field. There's so much more work that that mm-hmm. needs to be done to understand exactly what's going on here. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you all for joining. This was awesome. really, really fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've definitely taken thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for being here. I'm drinking coffee as we're talking about this to suppress. <laughs> I'm still drinking at 10 o'clock tonight. Yeah. I'm going to Okay. Uh, point taken. Um, yeah. But thank you all for being here. And just some real quick announcements for everyone watching. Um, the registration for the online BDD conference is now open. Um, and this is a good opportunity to learn more about BDD, whether you're not, whether you're a professional or whether you're someone um, with a disorder, someone who knows someone with BDD. And we'd love to hear from you. You can take our live stream survey to tell us what you'd like to see on this platform. Um, the survey can be found at isdf.org backslash live stream survey. There's the link. Um, yeah. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for watching. Thanks to our panelists. And we'll see you next month. Bye, guys. Bye. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.